Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, welcome to the Facebook Live for February. And um, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about infidelity and uh, deception in partnerships and how to think about um, what establishing trust is about, what that means, um, how you can know. You know. A lot of us are looking to establish trust when trust has been broken. And it matters to us a lot often. And so um, th that is to say that the idea of reestablishing trust matters to us because we don't like not being able to trust our partners clearly. And so I'm going to respond specifically to one of the questions that I think that was submitted anonymously um, and use that as a kind of reference point for answering this question, but I'll be answering it a little bit more broadly than just that. Um, let me pull that up. There we go. So this is the question. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd love to hear about your experiences recovering from deception or breaches in trust in your relationships. I discovered some evidence of emotional infidelity a year ago with my spouse. He didn't bring it up. We talked fairly extensively, and I don't blame him entirely for the issues related, hence me working on my relationship to desire so I can be a better self and show up better in my marriage. We didn't really address how to rebuild trust, and then he felt like trust was something I needed to give back. I think more recently he would have said, it needed to be earned. I'm not entirely sure what that sentence means. If he felt that he needed to earn it, or I'm not sure exactly. But uh, I've had moments of what I interpreted as insecurity or paranoia. But a few nights ago, there were additional issues of deception he brought up because I finally expressed the anxiety I felt. He says I and the kids are the world to him, and I think he feels that. I also feel that although I have work I need to do, my biggest concern is what would be necessary to establish trust for me. It's very difficult to digest all of this when I specifically asked multiple times if there was anything else he wanted to tell me, and he refused. I'm currently going through the Art of Desire course. I've listened to all the podcasts, and we have both the online couples courses um, that we will start soon, as soon as I finish the Art of Desire. I know Jennifer has talked about trust briefly in the podcast about pornography disclosure and some other ideas of betrayal trauma. I'd love to know if there have been other discussions that may have more of what the process would look like, how I can be forthcoming about my concerns without blaming, and what I really need to look for in the future to track if this is something we are really resolving and who's responsible for what part in that process. Okay. Good. There's a lot of really good questions there, and I hope I can keep track of them uh, and give enough response to them. One of the tricky things about this, and, and maybe we can even sort out a better way to do it, is that um, I have to make some assumptions to be able to make a response, and, and the more accurate those assumptions are, obviously, the more relevant. Um, so, you know, maybe at some point we will have Ruby or an anonymous other if they want to be on the call to actually be more in a conversation with me because I think it, it might be a little bit easier for people listening to make the information relevant to them. So let me just start with um, some of my primary ideas in thinking about this. The tricky thing, of course, is that um, let me just, let me just start with a really basic idea. Uh, infidelity, whether it's emotional, or sexual, um, is a is a very easy thing for human beings to do. Which is not me excusing it or saying it's inconsequential or we need to get over it. Because I think as human beings, we we kind of want the, we want the security of partnership and a marriage, and we want to know our spouse is being loyal to us. But because of the issues of validation and how tempted we are by validation, it's very easy to go and get the the, the validation that can be available to us in the form of extramarital energy, okay? And whatever level somebody takes that to, it is a it can be a basic disloyalty as soon as you go and you're getting from somebody else what you um, what you know your spouse would not be comfortable with you getting from them. Um, I think Ruby, if you can actually look for this for me. 
and maybe send it in a text. I know that somebody in that question followed up with another question that I think is about that, like how do you define what constitutes emotional infidelity? If you can find that on the, on the Facebook page and post it to me in a text, then I can make sure I'm responding to what the follow-up question was. Um, so, so I think, you know, let me just say a little bit about that. Whenever we know we're doing something that we wouldn't want our spouse to know, okay, because we know they wouldn't be okay with the way we're interacting with somebody, even if it's just at an energetic level, well, that's in my view, it constitutes a breach, okay? It constitutes that you're now doing, so you're, dis, you're withholding information from your partner that you know would matter to them to know because you don't want to deal with the consequence of their response. And, you know, lots of people do this. It's a very human thing to do. Again, not me making it okay, just is that what human beings really readily do. So um, when someone feels insecure in a marriage, feels invalidated in a marriage, feels uh, that they're not getting the love they think they're entitled to or they want, uh, unfaithful engagement can be very tempting. And, and that's, not, again, not me saying that it legitimizes it. Um, okay, somebody just wrote a question. How do you rebuild trust in emotional and physical intimacy with a narcissistic spouse? Is it possible? My quick response to that is no, it's not possible. <laughs> okay. And I'm not saying that I know your spouse is narcissistic, uh, but no, it's not possible because a narcissistic person is unwilling to be known. They want to be validated and propped up. They're not willing to confront who they are to actually create something that's intimate. They will relate to you only in terms as it, in as much as it reinforces them, which is a validation system, not an intimacy system. So, um, so, it's easy to, and then, so a lot of unfaithful energy is driven not by the desire for sex, it's driven by the desire for validation, which could be sexual, and it's also driven often by the um, contempt and hostility one feels towards one's spouse for not having given them the validation they think they're entitled to. And so a lot of times what's driving that unfaithful engagement or the justification of it is the anger that you can't get from your partner what you want or what you think you're owed. Just a second, Ruby just wrote me this question. Maybe the question you were referring, no, it's not that one. It was later, actually, Ruby, sorry. It's, it's like, I think one of the last ones where they said, you know, can you address this? Um, okay, so, um, Sorry, I'm just keeping track of multiple things at once here. Let me get back to my main thread. So, okay. So, and, and then the other thing I would say is some people are unfaithful, not because there's anything wrong in their marriage, but because they like the energy they're getting. And it's easy to think, oh, this must be basically a judgment on the marriage. It can be. But sometimes it's just we, we like validation and we can go where it is, whether or not that's good for us or good for our partnership. Okay, so here's somebody, I think this is basically the question. How do you determine if it's an emotional affair? I think that's all they said. Yes, I think that's right. So, Ruby, you don't need to look anymore. Yeah, I think that how you determine it, I mean, I don't know that there's a neat category, but basically it comes down to this issue of deception. Uh, if it's just a friendship, there's no hiding of anything, right? You don't need to, you don't need to mask anything, and your spouse could be a part of any of those conversations or engagements at any time because it's all above board. So that might be a friendship that you have, but you're not trying to keep something special and hidden. The act of hiding constitutes infidelity. It, now, there's ranges in infidelity, okay? There's, you know, you're engaging somebody's flirtatious energy at work versus you're having a full-on three-year sexual affair with a high school girlfriend or something, okay? So there's, there's clearly a range and they have different implications for the partnership. But I think as soon as you go into the realm of deception and trying to keep something special for yourself without your partner knowing, you have now moved into the frame of infidelity or, or affair. And, okay, and, and I'll come to the specific question, but I'll say, you know, sometimes people suffer a lot in their marriages and it becomes a more tempting place to go. But when it's not above board and lacking in integrity, it's very costly both to the person who's willing to engage in that way and to the partnership. And so, you know, it's the, it's the deception 
that is an easy, natural man thing to do, but is precisely what creates the chaos and the uh, disorganization in a marriage that then people pay a big price for over time. So, um, so let me now go back to the question. So I'm keeping my comments tethered to the question. Um, so one of the important things that this person says is that I discovered some evidence of emotional infidelity a year ago with my spouse. He didn't bring it up. Now that, that matters because it's one thing when a spouse comes in, and it's not everything, but it matters when a spouse comes and says, look, I need you to know about something. I have been really tempted by the energy or I've even been kind of hiding from you the fact that I've been doing X, Y, and Z. It's an act of integrity usually. Um, it's an act of I'm not okay with what I'm doing and I need to come clean and I need to play this straight. And that in and of itself creates a lot more trustworthiness. You may be enraged that your spouse was willing to, uh, to abandon his or her integrity. You may be really upset that they were willing to mask things from you, but the fact of their coming forward is very much uh, a signal that they have an issue with themselves, that it's not you that's trying to extract trustworthiness out of them, which will never work well, okay? It's that they have to deal with their, they, they need to deal with themselves, and that's inherently a more trustworthy position. I talk about this a lot in the, the relationship course, is that the self-confrontation, the willingness to deal with who you are in the marriage, you may be getting information from your spouse, but you're not keeping them responsible for holding you to it. You take the information and you square it with your own integrity and your own issue uh, with yourself. And then it's coming out of a solid position. And not only will you become more at peace with yourself when you deal with this, but you become inherently more trustworthy because people, your spouse, people close to you, track you as somebody who's dealing with himself or herself. So the fact of having to extract this from a spouse it creates anxiety because of what it means. You were, were you going to ever tell me? Uh, how long were you going to hide this from? Why were you? How did you feel justified in doing it? Right. Those are all really important questions, and they are at the core of the question of trust. She goes on to say, "We talked fairly extensively, and I don't blame him entirely for the issues related. Hence, me working on my relationship to to desire, so I can be a better self and show up better in my marriage." Okay. Now, I wanted to speak to that a little bit because there's both strength in that and possible limitation in it. What I think she's saying, and I think this is um, good, excuse me, is good, is she's saying there is a context that I think I'm a part of in which it made sense or felt tempting for him to go look for validation elsewhere. And I, I think that's a legitimate position to take. Let me give you the perverse form so we can compare the two. The perverse form of that is this is my fault, basically. And if I were a more desirous wife and I would get my act together, um, this wouldn't have happened. And the perverse form of it is easy, it's tempting, because we want more control in these situations often than we have. So sometimes our desire to take all the responsibility is a way of trying to get control of something we don't have, which is, you know, you don't, you can't control if someone loves you or if they'll be faithful to you. That's in their court, that's their decision. The other thing I would say is you could be a rotten spouse, okay, and terrible and exploit every basic assumption of the marriage and still a spouse could choose to not be disloyal to that agreement and they might, you know, have some integrity and say I'm really unhappy and I think I'm going to leave this marriage and the person in the office is really looking good to me because I, because of what, how miserable it's been here, but at least that's above board, right? So nobody drives their spouse into infidelity. Everybody gets to decide who they are. But I think this person is taking a fair position because she's saying, I believe that I'm part of a context of meaning between us, which is not to say it's all my fault, in which he may have justified himself. And I want to work with at least the part I have control over. And I respect that um, position. Um, she then says, um, we, didn't, we didn't really address how to rebuild trust. And then he felt like trust was something I needed to give back. 
Okay. And then she goes on to say, I think more recently he would have said it needed to be earned. So may maybe what he's saying is he's taking a more moderate position within himself. I think that's maybe what she's saying. This is not an unusual position for someone who's been, what often happens is somebody who's breached the marital contract in some way has been kind of tortured by it. And then when they, the information comes forward, they feel relieved often. Like, okay, phew, it's finally out. It's finally knowable, and I feel much better. And now she or he, depending on who the unfaithful one is, is now all upset. And I'm like ready to have this be behind me because I've been fretting about this for a while. And now I have to go through their pain and their discomfort. And so a lot of times the person who um, is now in the thick of the invalidation because now they've come clean, their spouse sees them, and the spouse is really upset because they don't like what they see and they probably shouldn't like what they see. It, they're saying, wait, you've been presenting as Mr. Nice Guy or you know, a trustworthy woman when in fact you've been willing to be dishonest with me, to see me over the course of a year or more or whatever it is, and I don't like what I see. And that's a fair position. <laughs> it's true. But oftentimes the person that's getting, getting the, the critique fairly, okay, and I'm not saying that someone who feels betrayed is always being fair, but at least part of what they're saying is a true acknowledgement of who the untrustworthy one has been, that a lot of times people want to get away from that as soon as possible and say, look, okay, it's good now. I'm never going to do it again. Get over it. <laughs> and, you know, they want the other person to settle down and to start giving them trust, and it's a way of trying to get or extract the reflected sense of self that they want and get away from what they have control over, which is what kind of person they are. They don't have control, excuse me, they don't have control over whether or not they get their spouse's approval. They only have control over the kind of person they are, and often the move we want to make is, I'm a better person, knock it off, get over it, uh, why do you have to keep persecuting me about this? And, you know, if somebody is persecuting somebody over two years, okay, Clearly, <laughs> some people do. That's the position they want to take. The person that's been betrayed often wants to get on the moral high ground, and I see this a lot in pornography disclosure. You want the moral high ground of a superior position to basically mask any anxiety you have about what your role might be in their decision making, and also as a way of just kind of persecuting and managing your damaged sense of self through your spouse's choices. Does that make sense to people? So if it doesn't post your questions for clarification, but you know, it's, it's very easy to um, want to basically perpetrate, punish the person who was unfaithful or broke the marital assumption as a way of trying to prop up your sense of self. And while it feels good, okay, and that's why we like it so much, it doesn't help us get stronger. It's certainly understandable up front. Um, I would never be talking to people about forgiving or anything like that up front. You know, it's certainly a natural and reasonable response. But a lot of us kind of get locked in there like it's a way of being in the relationship of I'm the betrayed and you're the loser and we're going to do this relationship from I'm, I'm superior to you. Um, okay, so let me go back here. Um, okay. I have had moments of what I interpreted as insecurity or paranoia. Okay, good. But a few nights ago, there was additional issues of deception that he brought up because I finally expressed the anxiety I felt. And I think the important thing for you to think about in this is that, yeah, you were thinking, oh, I'm just paranoid, I'm insecure, what's my problem? But in fact, that you ought to trust your gut. And this is, this is the upside for people who have been tracking something is up with their spouse and they keep thinking they're crazy and every time they bring something up, you know, for some people their spouse twists it into, why don't you trust me and, you know, what, no, you're just making stuff up and they think they're crazy and then they start to figure out, like, no, I'm actually mapping reality and that's the upside of all this is that at least I know what I know, uh, that I am able to track when something's off and so that's the good news is that you're saying, there was stuff that he kept deceiving me around, which of course makes it very hard to trust him because 
I think you go on to say this. He says, I and the kids would mean the world to him, which I'm sure you do, but that's different than whether or not he's going to be trustworthy. And I think he feels that. I'm sure he does. I also feel that although I have work I need to do, my biggest concern is what would be necessary to establish trust for me. The simple answer is, and I appreciate how you're saying it, because yes, you may well need to develop aspects of yourself, become a more strong, solid woman yourself, which is good for the relationship, but it's very good for you, and you're going to need that strength. Uh, because you're confronting your husband's limitations and a dependency on him is going to not work well uh, for either of you um, because it pressures him to mask and pretend and it also keep, keeps you anxious and uncertain and unstable. And so, yes, the, although I have work I need to do, my biggest concern is what would be establish trust for me and this is going to be a little bit of an annoying response but it is the response the way that would be, the way to establish trust for you in your husband is for him to become trustworthy which he isn't yet um, and so you're you don't trust him out of good judgment at this point you don't trust him at this point because you're mapping what's real and as hard and as sobering as that is because it's not the picture you want. The fact that you're willing to stay awake to it is really important for you becoming more solid, knowing what's up and what's down, and being able to even track if he becomes a trustworthy person or not. Right? You have to trust your own radar to be able to trust what you map about him, because if your need, and this may not be true for you, but it's often true for people in marriages, they need so much to see their spouse as trustworthy that they corrupt their own ability to map reality because they don't want to deal with what they feel and see. And that's dangerous in relationships. If you need too much for your spouse to be what you want them to be, you're going to be less able to deal with what is real and therefore always insecure and reinforcing dependency on someone who is not dependable. So that's the hard position that you're in right now is that you are seeing that my husband not only lied to me a year ago and I found it, but I've been trying to extract more information from him all this time that he's been willing to keep putting me off until, and this is a moment of integrity in him that he sounds like he was willing to finally bring it up and say, okay, you've been tracking me right and there is more. And that's, that's good. But the, the hard reality is that he's been willing to play in um, manipulating my mind for as long as he has. And that's not good. And that makes him untrustworthy and it makes it right for me to not trust. Now, that's different than you need to be persecuting him at all times and that you need to make him pay. I, I don't know that that is what it would mean, but it means that you can take a solid position in saying, of course I don't trust you because there is no reason yet that I ought to. And until you deal with your own dishonesty and your own untrustworthiness and really deal with that in yourself, you aren't going to be a trustworthy person, full stop. And so I want to trust you, but more than I want to trust you, I want a trustworthy husband. <laughs> that makes sense so I'll trust you when you're trustworthy and that's something that I get to decide not that you need to prove to me meaning it's not in his it's not his job to get you to trust him it's his job to be trustworthy you know a lot of us use this language of I need to show my spouse that I love them I need to basically um, how do people always say it I'm trying to think how people say it um, I need to communicate love kind of thing and that's, in my view, the idea that I need to get them to see that I love them rather than I need to be loving. I'm not, I don't need to get you to trust me. I need to know that I'm trustworthy. You can decide whether or not you're going to open your heart back up to me. There's reason for you not to. You, you are in control of that. And I think it's fair in any uh, situation like this to see that a couple, usually in any breach, there is evidence of this couple needing to grow, both the person who was willing to be unfaithful, but usually it's a marker of something that needs to grow up in the marriage. In this case, it may be about developing your sexuality and, and your ability to 
be in a full partnership out of a deeper sense of personhood, right? But I don't see that so much as, oh, he's been so sexually deprived that he's now looking elsewhere. That could be going on here. But what I think it more is that it's been a validation system that has, uh, that, that is sort of um, crumbling, okay, as it needs to. And it's giving you the chance to each become stronger, higher integrity people that are more in a position to choose each other than to be dependent upon each other. So let me, there's a bit of a lag here. So give me any thoughts you're having or questions you're having while I go back to the question here and just make sure there's nothing that I'm not responding to because um, there's about 15 second lag here. So while you're doing that. Okay, I think I've covered it basically. So, oh, here we go, sorry. Lots of things. Sorry. <laughs> I just have to scroll. Okay. Okay. This person is just going back to this narcissistic tendencies. Um, I, I'm going to go past that for now because that might be something I can take up in another one. What if they hide it because they think you overreact looking for something that isn't there? No. I'm going to just say a lot of people take that position. The reason I didn't tell you is because I just knew you, I didn't want, I didn't want to hurt you or I knew you were going to freak out and be mean. Okay. Well, look, an integrity position is irrespective of your response. I have a responsibility to be honest and play it straight. And it's an easy thing to want to justify, um, um, deception. We're often looking for ways to do it, but that's basically the idea that, you know, you owe me, good feelings about me so I can lie to you if you don't give me that. Now, of course, if you're an overreactor, you want to think about why you are because you're actually interfering from the information you say you supposedly want. And I think it's really worth thinking about, you know, what do I need to do for myself? Maybe I'm more interested in punishing him than I'm interested in knowing what's real. If I want to know what's real, probably need to settle down enough to actually, um, uh, get some real information that I need. Okay. So this person says, I think we often over accuse people for having emotional affairs. You're, you are saying that hiding is a key to identifying it. Yes. What are some examples of situations that are not emotional affairs, but are often misconstructed as such? I'm just thinking about that question. I think, um, I'm trying to think if I can think of something that's been misconstructed. I mean, it's kind of a high level descriptor to say it's an emotional affair. I mean, an affair implies a sort of in-depth relationship that's gone on for a while. And maybe people would call what they can tell is flirtatious energy or masking a relationship. Maybe people want to call it an affair when in fact it's just, um, a lower level form of validation seeking. That's possible that people would want to call that an affair as a way to get it into the form that they could then go after the other person. And people who maybe feel very jealous, maybe would want to do that, that they have a difficult time with the fact that their partner can have other meaningful relationships or enjoy other people's company, but that they really aren't doing anything that's, um, under the radar. I think it's just an important measure. You, you can be hiding something and still not have it be an affair. Okay. So you might be hiding something because your spouse really can't handle it. You have a friendship with somebody. And so you, you hide it just like you, people might hide, you know, if they feel like their spouse can't handle them having their own life, they kind of hide their own life to manage the mind of their spouse. That doesn't necessarily make them unfaithful. But it does mean that they're having a hard time dealing with the invalidation of their spouse to carve out enough space for them to live their lives. The way that you can do it though, is you stop making your spouse being okay with something the issue and you make your integrity the issue. And so you're not hiding anything. You're saying, yeah, no, I'm doing that. You are welcome to come. You're welcome to be a part of it. And I have nothing to hide, but I'm not going to run my life based on your feelings. That would be somebody using the idea of an emotional affair to control the partner, the antidote is not reassuring the spouse. The antidote is being above board and trustworthy and owning your own position, honestly. 
Um, I always like validation. <laughs> okay, and then uh, says, I like what you said about people wanting to communicate that they are trustworthy, when in reality the way to do it is to be trustworthy. Exactly. Yes. And again, it's what we have control over. We don't have control over whether or not our spouse thinks we're desirable or legitimate. We have control over our desirability and, you know, our trustworthiness and our own clarity of self. And the more we try to get somebody else to give it to us, the more that we, um, the more that we um, get the the control mechanism in the wrong place and it keeps us stuck and trying to be controlling of each other. And this is what at the core of infidelity is, is trying to control the other, you know, I want you to be happy with me, so I'm not gonna give you information. I want the security of the partnership while I go and get validation elsewhere. But I don't want you to go anywhere, that's why I'm keeping the information from you. And so I want, I want to control the validation to come in, but I, the only way I'm gonna get it is if I deceive my way into it. Because if my spouse knew what I was doing, she wouldn't be validating me. Okay, well, that's, that's a dishonest position and it's a low integrity position and it's bad for the person doing it as much as it's bad for the relationships. Okay, so I'm gonna stop in, unless other people have questions or anything they want to get clarity on. I'll just get, oh, okay, here's some more. What does it say about a person that wants the attention of the opposite sex but has no desire to have an actual affair, emotional or physical? Um, I'm just thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, I think what it is is, is and people can come out of their own vulnerabilities that, that can drive some of this. People may be like, I don't want to rupture my relationship. I have no interest in having any kind of an affair, but I certainly like getting people's attention. And it can feel, you know, it's just trying to get validation. You're just trying to get the kind of ivy drip of approval. And I, I think, you know, that while it may be more minimal how destructive it is, the uh, effort to do that can certainly be destructive um, because you're playing with validation and extracting something that you wouldn't like if your spouse. This is the question. Would I be okay if my spouse were doing this? Um, what? Even if I can sort of paper over it and make it inconsequential, do I know I'm doing something that I don't really respect in me and I wouldn't respect in somebody else, right? Um, it's easy to think you're getting away with things like that, but people track energy all the time. It's, people track sexual energy like crazy. Um, this is how people, you know, we, we, we learn to map sexual energy and sexual interests from about age 11 on. And so, um, yeah, you can tell yourself that it's all innocent and, and inconsequential when in fact it really is um, doing and creating something, even if it's not, you know, in the form of an affair. How would you encourage a couple working through this to navigate what is reasonable based on the breaches and what is invasive? I'm trying to understand that. How would you encourage a couple working on this to navigate what is reasonable? I don't quite understand the question, let's see. I think maybe what you're saying is what should this couple do? I mean, I think what I would say is that she she's right to kind of own her own position and to be um, clear in it that, you know, I don't trust you. And, and that's not like where I want to be. I'd like to, I'd like for you to be trustworthy, but you've been very comfortable lying to me. And that's really concerning. And I've maybe wanted so much to see you as a certain kind of guy that I, that I've been willing to be complicit on some level in that until a year ago. I don't know if that's true or not for this person, maybe not. But I think that, you know, I've been trying to extract the truth out of you for a year and I appreciate you coming and telling me, but that's very concerning for me that that's what it took and I have to look at, maybe I've been a person who's been easier to take advantage of than I realize. And I need to think about maybe if I am more a part of your unhappiness than I've wanted to see, not as a way of trying to control you into the right kind of husband, but to be fair and reasonable in the relationship. But then you have to deal with what you think is your job. I maybe need to be more grown up to see what's real. I don't know if that's true for this person. She seems pretty awake to me. Um, but for some people, they are complicit in kind of going blind to things. Um, I need to think about what I may really have to deal with in myself to be a better partner. 
but that's not the, a guarantee that you're going to become a good partner to me. So I'll do a lot with my part. That's what it always is about. Um, this person says, it sounded like you said it's not okay to lie, that you, don't, you can't lie where you're afraid of your partner's reaction and are trying to control them, ensure a certain action, prevent a certain action. If that is accurate, then what about where one partner fears for the safety of their children? Well, then that's different. Um, without knowing the specifics of that, if, if you really think information flow would put your children in genuine risk and that's not just a way of justifying something, then obviously safety of children is a big deal and it's important. You just want to look at how honest that position is, that's all. Um, always look forward to hearing your expertise. I always leave with so many things to confront in myself. Awesome, you're awesome. Okay, how do you know when a person, okay, I think there's not an end to that, maybe she comes back. Oops, how do you know when a person is trustworthy again? I find myself doubting my own instincts. Well, one thing I would say about that, I'll come to, back to you here in a second. Uh, one thing I would say is that um, everything lines up. You know, I know this is going to sound bad maybe to some people, but I, I would never say I trust my husband 100%. And that's not because he's not trustworthy. It's because I never relinquish my responsibility for mapping what's real. So my husband keeps earning my trust. That's the great news. Everything always lines up. You can slice it in any direction and everything's consistent. That's a trustworthy person. I had a couple come into my office once and she was saying, look, he used to um, hire prostitutes. He used to go do all these things and it's been eight years and he came clean and he went through a church court and all this stuff. And I just still can't trust him, right? So then I'm trying to figure out, well, is it that he's just still not trustworthy? Or is she somebody who can't, is not willing to lean into what she sees, that he is trustworthy? Or is it that she's mapping that he's not? So I just start slicing into that picture. And, you know, I'm like, how do you handle it now when you are traveling? What do you do now? Well, anyway, the picture just couldn't hang together. It wasn't, there wasn't integrity in the position. You could, anytime he would give me a picture and I would ask him to give me more about that picture, it would crumble under itself. I, sometimes if I'm teaching therapists, I'll tell them what I mean by that. But basically, you can slice through it in multiple ways and it hangs together. The data lines up. If there is something that doesn't line up, you can go to it and say, hey, this doesn't line up, why not? And the reason you get, you know, is true. You feel it's true. If you feel like you've got to convince yourself that it's true, it's probably not true. And if you find yourself wanting to make yourself be okay with something, you're probably dis being, you're probably deceiving yourself. Um, okay, I'm gonna only take a couple more because I know we're getting close to being at the end here. Um, oh, going back to here. Aren't there other behaviors that are as hurtful as a physical affair, bullying? Yes, hundred percent. So there's lots of ways to be unfaithful in a sense. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make them all the same category because they're not. But I, I think there's a lot of ways to basically betray the marital contract and never have an affair. And there's lots of ways to be hurtful, no question. Um, will you ever consider writing a book? Yes, I'm going to. I promise, one day. I just still have two kids that need a lot of attention. And I've got other projects going. But I, I really am going to write one. Uh, as long as I stay healthy and nothing goes wrong. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see. I love that about never completely trusting yet having healthy trust in your life. Do you have any good articles? Oh, no, I don't think I do. But maybe I'll try and write one sometime. I'm trying to think about that. Can an emotional affair be a negative affair where one partner is not taking actions to find approval, emotional joy from another, but is not doing anything to provide that inside the marriage. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's just another version of I'm not being, bringing my best self to the marriage, and I'm not really dealing with my role. And, you know, again, there's a lot of ways to be cruel in a marriage. You know, you can be cruel through sexual, excessive, meaning sexually indulgent, unfaithful behavior, but you can also be untrue to a marriage by repressing your sexuality and telling your spouse to deal with it, right? <laughs> There's a lot of ways to harm. And so you can basically, you can join into a marriage and say, like, here I am, take me as I am, and if you're unhappy, you're the problem. A lot of people do that, and, you know, you can create marriage as a kind of prison, 
or you can see it as a commitment to yourself and God about who you're going to be relative to that promise. Uh, that you to, to that arrangement that you're going to bring your best self because this person has dared to join your life and you're going to make it worth their while to the best of your ability you can't make them be the ideal partner but you can bring your best self and that's not a doormat position a lot of people think that's what i mean i mean you're bringing your best self which is you're willing to deal with problems you're willing to deal with the issues of your own integrity you're willing to be a good friend uh, good friends bring up hard things and deal with them straight but you're willing to bring your best self. And when you don't do that, you know, it creates pain. Okay. All right. I keep scrolling and then there's a whole bunch more. Okay. Let me just quickly see. Okay. My, we recently found out my father-in-law's had multiple emotional affairs. How do I show support to both my in-laws in this situation? That's a big question. I don't know that I have a quick answer to that. Maybe that's someone though that I could bring up another time. Um, What if you've been trustworthy, this is a good one, what if you've been trustworthy for some time, but your spouse is unwilling to confront her own anxiety and fear, but insists it's her instincts and still won't trust? Is there anything else one can do to show trustworthiness? Again, I wouldn't be showing trustworthiness. I think I would just say, um, if, if, if you think this is really what it is, if you're like, no, I really am being trustworthy and I have been for a long time, you know, I, I think I would be talking more about like this, I think I would say, um, I really have been bringing my best, most trustworthy self, if it's true, to this marriage for X number of time. And I think your instincts, I can't control it. You, you get to decide if you trust me, you get to decide if you're gonna deal with who I am now or not. I can't control that. Either your instincts are about that you have so much regressive fear that you can't map accurately what's happening, okay, and, and, and whether or not you're going to deal with that is up to you, or are you basically invested in not trusting me, which a lot of people are. They're invested in not opening up trust again because they don't want the risk of re-engaging, and they'd rather be in the fault safety, I guess I don't need quotes for that, the fault safety <laughs> of being in a superior position, of being the injured victim. That's some of my issue with some of these betrayal trauma groups is they can create a safety in always being the injured victim rather than the strength one needs to map what's real and to re-engage and reinvest if it's smart to do so. And I, I, I mean, I'm speaking somewhat globally because some of these groups may well do that. But, um, okay, I'm going to take this last comment and then we'll stop. I'm taking the Art of Desire class. It makes sense that develop, that when something, when sex feels obligated, but there's a little more to it. If the husband is addicted to porn, he's expecting my help in another way. If I get him off, then he isn't, oh, no. Then he isn't tempted by the porn. No, that's not true. No. We will take that up soon, okay? <laughs> so I'm torn. No, the idea that if some, you, you have to give your spouse an orgasm so he won't look at porn is the wrong idea. First of all, lots of people are willing to do both, okay? Give me an orgasm and then I'm still gonna look at porn. And uh, it's not the same thing. Anyway, there's just so much there, I don't even know where to start. It, it, because it, it's not about a man having an orgasm, then he can control himself. A man's gonna control himself or not. He's going to be trustworthy or not. He's going to be straight about who he is or not. Um, the issue of I don't want my spouse to suffer, well, that's a different question. You know, you're not supposed to take care of his temptations. That's silliness. I mean, I don't mean I sound so insulting right now. I don't mean it like that. I mean, this is an idea that we have taught women and men for so long, and it keeps us stuck in the, in the problem. It keeps us mired in our problem. So sorry, I'm sounding a little annoying right now. I'm sorry about that. So I, I don't mean that. I mean, I don't want to be obligated to take care of his temptations, most definitely. What you might want to think about is, am I a part of my spouse's unhappiness? And if I am, in what way? That's what I need to deal with. And what do I need to look at in myself if I think I'm a part of his unhappiness? If I think he's not happy sexually, how am I a part of that? But that's a, a very different question than I'm supposed to manage his sexuality so he doesn't look at porn. And sorry that I was a little bit um, 
snarky there. <laughs> I hear these things so much that I start to get like, oh, I hate that. But that is what so many of us have been taught is precisely that idea. If you are a good wife and you put out sexually, then he won't. Therefore, you must do this. And it exactly creates the meaning that keeps people completely stuck. It entitles men often to their sexual indulgence. And it creates an obligation frame for women that makes them never want sex for good reason. Because <laughs> Sex is about managing and trying to control you, not about trying to show up and care about you and share a part of me with you and really be with you. So it's um, hopefully as you go through the course, you'll be able to see more of the paradigm shift that will help you step into a more healthy frame. And I'm gonna, as you know, I've probably said a hundred times, I really am doing this. I'm going through it and I'm developing the course, but I'm gonna be doing a men's sexuality course in which I will be talking a lot more about pornography, how couples relate to that idea, other ways of thinking about and relating to it that will make them uh, free people up to have higher integrity and higher intimacy in their marriages. Okay, I have to go. My goodness. <laughs> so, all right. I love you all, <laughs> even though I can't see anybody. And uh, it's fun being with you, and I'll see you in um, a month. Bye.